We are in the middle of the biggest epidemic our country has ever faced. I'm not talking about the scourge of terrorism that's in the news these days, though that has some, th some play in this factor here. I'm not talking about unscrupulous banks who are doing things that are causing major economic recessions, though that has some input in this. I'm not talking about Donald Trump and the GOP debates, though he definitely adds to this. The epidemic I'm talking about is stress. How many of you can count yourselves amongst the 95% of Americans who report that they have to deal and handle stress on a daily basis? Yeah. This is a statistic that comes out from the American Psychological Association. How often do you lay awake at night wondering if you're uh, going to be able to pay your next month's bills, send your children to college, wondering if your 401k is still going to be there after the stock market takes another roller coaster ride, or um, you know, or being a public service organization that now you're out there in the public mixing with people with all this terrorist activity in the news that bring up a little extra anxiety to the, the things that you're doing. You know, stress is a fact of our lives and if it's not taken care of, if it's not dealt with, it permeates into all of the aspects of our lives, our relationships. Soon you find yourself bickering with your significant other about innocuous things like where to place the salt and pepper shakers on the table. You know? Or you begin to develop anxiety attacks. It starts to affect your health. Your blood pressure goes up. You find that you're wasting much time and much financial means going to doctors looking for solutions that generally work only on a mediocre basis. Worst of all, Stress robs you of your happiness. So what can we do about it? Well, maybe you've tried some things already. Maybe you've tried to avoid your stress by watching TV or going to the club and downing a few with the buddies or, you know, binge eating. Maybe you've tried to hunker down and get ahead of that stress by saying, if I just work a little harder, I can, I can get in front of that curve and then I can relax. Well, most of these solutions have a temporary effect, but usually they end up just creating more stress. So, what can we really do? My message today is really that the most powerful way to deal with stress in your life is adopting a spiritual perspective towards it and working on a couple of specific practices. Now these ideas come from my 10 years in a monastery and the experience of living this day in and day out. So they aren't uniquely my ideas. And they also come from my practice as a holistic coach and therapist working for the last eight years helping people get through stress, anxieties, and other scourges of life. So what is the spiritual approach to stress reduction? Well, I would say that it's the same approach as how we would find lasting happiness and well-being, and that is adopt a spiritual lifestyle. Now, from my monastic experience, this really has two cornerstones, meditation and service. So, I thought this would be a great topic here today because you guys are already halfway there. Kiwanis is a great service organization. You know how service can help. Well, both of these, both meditation and service, help you to get out of your little self, your ego self that has all these worries and concerns. It helps you find a greater sense of being in, in the world. So you guys already know this as far as how service helps you to do that, to when you start putting your concerns on other people, you stop worrying about what's going on in your life. <clears throat> and the miraculous part about that is, when you take care of others, somehow your cup 
of happiness and, and needs gets fulfilled too. It, it seems to be a spiritual law. Uh, so I don't need to talk so much about service here today, and that gives me time in the short time we have to focus more on meditation. Now meditation helps us get out of our little self by going within. Service is outer oriented, meditation is inner oriented. It helps us to go within and find the greater us, the higher self, the soul, if you will. And I, it gives us a perspective of who we are in, in this grand scheme of life. I, I like, there's a, a poster out there, and maybe you've seen it on the internet or in a poster, but it's of the Milky Way galaxy, you know, this spiraling galaxy of stars with the sun in the center. And there's this arrow that points somewhere close to the middle that says, you are here. You know, I mean, that kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? I mean, you with all your little problems and uh, the anxieties and the stress that you feel are here in this vast expanse of the universe. Now, that, I'm not saying that to minimize that we have very real concerns and, and problems. The, so the other part of really uh, meditation and going within, how that helps, I like to liken to a hurricane. Now when we're in the midst of our, our problems and, and our issues, it's like being in the gale force winds of a hurricane. You know, we're getting blown around, buffeted, buildings are falling down, roofs are flying off, floods, all, you know, life is tumultuous. However, if you go into the middle of the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane, completely calm. The sun is shining, there's no clouds. The water is, is nice and easy. The air is completely still. So this is the same way. If we go within through meditation, though our lives may be tumultuous on the outside, we go within, we can find that calm stillness it can bring us some sense of peace and some sense of perspective to the stresses that we're feeling in our lives. Does that make sense? So, I'll give you a story of myself and how this helped. It was really, well, let me say this, that meditation as a monk was considered a very formal process. We sit very still and rigid, our minds supposed to stay focused and, and one-pointed, you sit for long hours, uh, your, your gaze is, is uplifted and still, and this is difficult for some people. So there, you know, there are other forms of meditation, if we broaden the definition somewhat, that are more accessible. And so let me give you a story here. That basically this story is where I was a monk, as I said, for 10 years. And this was about nine and a half years into my monastic career. And I was going along well. I, I applied myself. You know, service was what we did. And then meditations in the mornings and the evenings. And, and I planned to stay there for the rest of my life. That was, that was my idea. One day in meditation, I got these voices, essentially, this message of saying, it's time for you to leave. It's time for you to move along. Now, I didn't think much of it at first, because periodically throughout my monastic um, tenure, we, I get these things, you know, it's like you get frustrated at something and say, I want to leave, you know, so I should just go. But you meditate a little deeper and, and work through it, and usually it would just pass and you'd get back into the routine. Well, this time, this idea, the, this message was sticking with me. It wasn't leaving. And it started to create some consternation within me. I was... Uh, you know, I was at odds here. Here I dedicated my life to this path. You know, essentially it was like being married to the church, essentially. Uh, and then I was, you know, had these ideas that it was time to go. It was time to break away from that commitment and, 
and do something different. And what was that something different? So if you've ever had to face any transitions in your life, you know, be it, say, a divorce or moving out of your hometown or changing your jobs, then you know that this experience is often riddled with anxiety, with fears, with self-doubt, and just a lot of, what am I doing? What is the right answer? So it got so strong that even my, um, my meditations became unfocused. I, it was hard to fo focus. It was hard to focus on work. It's hard to focus on meditation. Uh, my physical health was suffering somewhat. It's hard to eat. And so what do I do? I enlisted the help of my counselors trying to, trying to find a solution. We looked at options. I, I, I went to see a psychologist. We talked about perhaps if I moved to another ashram environment, another monastery, uh, that would do it. Or if I changed my service work, that, that maybe that would change something. Maybe even get a dog. You know? But all these, all these solutions really, as, as we worked through them, didn't, didn't really pan out. So I was, I was at my wit's end. And then one of the other monks who knew what I was going through suggested that I go to this seminar that he had, had gone to, this uh, self-help seminar. And it, from his description, it interested me. And I went to my counselor and got permission to go and went. And in this course, we there was many things that we did, but this one particular process was a process of using our breath to breathe in a particular form and, and, and process that uh, took us, like meditation, deep inside ourselves. But unlike meditation, it had an extra benefit. It dredged up latent emotional issues and things that we've been stuffing down and holding back for, for a long time brought that stuff up and allowed it to express, allowed it to come out and, and clear. Then in that clear state, I got the idea that I would take the, each of my um, options, staying in the monastery or leaving the monastery, and I would breathe with them. And so the first one was to stay. I sat there and I breathed this technique with that in mind. I would, I, should I stay in the monastery? And as I did that, basically I felt a heaviness come over me. A heaviness and it felt very constricted. So then I went to the other option. Should I leave? Is that the best course of action for me? And again, as I breathed with this and let that, that filter through my consciousness, I got a sense of lightness and, and a sense of expansion. There was an excitement to that option. So I felt coming out of that experience, and by the way, that's, um, I outlined both that story and the step-by-step um, the, the -step technique in this book, uh, in, in the chapter that I wrote in this book. Uh, so if you want to dive into the deeper or try it for yourself. but. That gave me a, a sense of what my authentic motivation was, what was really resonating with me at a core level. And so when I went back to my counselor, I said, you know, I feel like I need to leave. And he said, you know, with, with full acceptance, go then. That's your path. And at that point, this weight just came off my shoulders. It was like I'd been carrying around I don't know, 100 pounds for the past three months, and, and finally it was lifted, and the stress had vanished. So I, I one, saw the efficacy of this technique, and now two, I was out in the world with not knowing what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> so but knowing how important you know, the foundation of a spiritual life was, and then also seeing that 
the world at large was desperately in need of some of the same training I got, only uh, for a large part, as I mentioned earlier, it was very difficult for people to sit for long periods of time in formal meditation. It was very difficult for people to keep their mind focused and concentrated. People also tended to have a resistance to sort of the religious overlay that came with meditation. And I saw that there was a unique opportunity to bridge the gap by providing Medium. people the same or similar experience with this breath work. So I became a breathwork facilitator. I, I, I got on track to taking all the courses um, and then began to apply this technique in my coaching practice to, with phenomenal results over the past eight years, helping people let go of stress and anxiety and live happier, more fulfilled lives. One particular client was... Uh, was a guy, he is a guy still, um, <laughs> his name is Daniel, he's about 30 something, he owns his own business in the real estate industry, and the, he came to me riddled with stress, his life, his work really, he had just let stress get a hold of him, and that had, that caused him to be a monster in the workplace. When he walked in to the office, everybody kind of shrank away and tried not to engage him because they knew if, if anything got under his skin, he would just explode and, and unleash it all on you. You'd be a pile of dust there you know, for everybody else to observe. So he wanted more than anything just to find some peace, but the stress had seeped into his life. He, he, he was at odds with his wife and they were having a very rocky time. He wasn't able to relate to his children. He was often late for meetings and different, you know, anything that he had to do. His, his stress basically kept him working to the last minute and then, you know, then event, uh, uh, being late to wherever he had to go next. And to top it off, like when he had to pee, if there was anybody else in the, the restroom, his stress made it impossible for him to <laughs> let it go. <laughs> so he tried different things. He tried to smoke pot, you know? He tried to escape his stress by being out there and mellow. But that worked a little bit, but it, you know, it didn't have a lasting effect. He tried to work harder. He hunkered down and tried to, you know, felt like if he could do more, maybe he'd have less stress, but that only added to his stress. He tried self-guided tapes of hypnosis and such, but he found he couldn't concentrate long enough to let them really be effective. So he met me because he had heard of one of my workshops that I was giving on this particular breathing technique and the, uh, the stress reducing capabilities of it. And he showed up and he, he had an experience there that made him want to work with me. So I started seeing him as a client on an individual level. We went for many weeks on coaching him and taking him through this technique. And, uh, as I, as he unfolded with his technique, the results were miraculous. He, he started to develop a relationship with his wife again. And he started to reconcile the differences and, and actually started to have a harmonious time in the household. His, he was able to relate to his children again. He, uh, he was able to relax around his challenges at work and instead of reacting when something went wrong or, or, or got him. He was able to take a few breaths and distance himself from it and then come up with a response and, and look for solutions that gave everybody else in the office a chance to relax and the environment there was, was much more peaceful and productive. So, uh, and to top it off, when he was in the bathroom, somebody came in, 
he can still let it go. <laughs> so, how many of you see the possibility of this kind of transformation in your life? You know? Yeah, good. And, you know, how many of you are willing to try out maybe just a simple technique of breathing that you could do for five minutes each day and maybe a little bit longer each week? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Great. Well, see me afterwards, and I'm going to come, then you know do. what's that? That would do. You already do. Excellent. Already meditate. Excellent. Excellent. This is great. Doing this with Jai's mind. Beautiful. And so you know, any any testimony you'd like to give? This basically the big thing about it is when you go into bed, and you you're tired, as you know what, but you can't stop thinking. That's the thing that helps me. You know, it just quiets my mind, allows me just to focus on what I'm trying to do. Go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you able to do a more formal meditative process where you sit still and um, your yeah. mind is still? And you're, yeah. Okay, great. I call that reading. Reading? <laughs> <laughs> but that that's one of the things that helps me read, too, is because like, when I get my mind just going so much and it's like, and think about this, I start reading something, and then my brain just spins off on all the different little things that I've heard about that in my life, but I can't concentrate on the book. Excellent. You know? So I just close my eyes a little bit, do some breathing, and then I'm okay. Get back into my reading again. But great, great. Well, so there you <laughs> go. There you have it. And and if you know, if formal meditation seems difficult to you or you know, or you you feel like there's some underlying emotional baggage that you'd like to clear out. The, these techniques of breath work seem to be uh, a unique option in the, in the toolbox of life, basically. So we're all in an epidemic of stress in this country today. And it will claim you if you don't do something about it. The best approach, in my opinion, is to live a spiritual lifestyle with the cornerstones of meditation and service. Meditation being brought into those different techniques such as breathwork and reading and other things. Add these things to your life and watch your life improve. And if you have any challenges along the way, or you want to get off on the right foot, you know I'm always here to consult. How many times a week is recommended meditation? How many times? Well, in the in the ashram, we meditated four hours a day, <laughs> well, on average four and a half hours a day, wow. and that was five times. So we meditate on our own in the morning for about an hour, then in a group for about an hour, then at lunchtime we meditate for half an hour, then in the evening we meditate in a group for an hour, and before we went to bed on our own for an hour. No talking, right? No, right. That was that was all very silent, going within, practicing techniques, particular techniques. Now, that that was that environment. That environment was created to do just that. Yeah. Those were our cornerstones. The meditation, if we weren't serving, if we weren't, you know, helping the community in some way, shape, or form, we ideally were meditating. And and those were the, the things that kept us in balance and kept us stress-free and, and happy. Now, for, for people in the world, it's a different situation. We have responsibilities. Our, you know, um, our mortgage has to be paid. Our, a lot more interaction. Our guests, yes. We have, you know, even just socially, we have to interact. It, it's like almost a requirement, you know, as well as taking the kids to school or to soccer practice or, or whatever. Or just standing out in your front door and going, hug me. <laughs> you know, if you don't do that, they look at you like you're, okay, this guy's weird. He just stands out there and looks at everything. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Thank you. So for, for people in the world, I'd say ideally once a day. Once a day for, in this case, to begin with, five minutes. To just do a basic five-minute Breathing practice can help center you, can help align you, so that then you go out and you, in your interactions, you aren't so quick to just bah, go into reaction mode. As that, you know, as you get more comfortable with that, as you, you 
You have committed that time, it's easier to start expanding it to 10 minutes and 15 minutes. And then, you know, ideally, you know, somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour would be, would be a, a quality meditation or a quality breath um, practice that you can do. And with the, with the breath work, what, uh, what I usually advise is that people do just a five minute session once a day on their own and then we have a longer intensive session, like these sessions I was talking about with Daniel and, and such, they would last an hour. And we'd go through this process, and in the course of an hour, it, you know, it, as I said, dredges up any discordant energies within it you, allows us to release, express, kind of aligns your energy so that by the end, you feel very light, very in tune, you know, very calm and responsive rather than reactive. And then, you know, to maintain that, you know, the, the benefit that you got from the longer sessions, then to do the short sessions once a day, just help keep that, you know, in your field of consciousness. And then the next week, do a longer session. That's the ideal uh, proposed schedule. So, you know, at first, just doing that five minutes can, can make a profound difference. 